the first thing I'd love to do is let's just kind of do a, a quick round of, of introductions. And um, Alex, let's kick off with you. Tell us a little bit about um, Electroactive Technologies and, and your role with the company. Yeah, I'm a, a co-founder and CEO at the company. And uh, we were actually started here locally in the Knoxville area. Um, the company was spun out of Oak Ridge National Lab and UT based on research I was doing during my PhD. And with my partner and co-founder, he was my advisor um, during my PhD at ORNL and, and UTK. And we had been developing a technology, you know, initially geared at looking at uh, converting waste from biomass and biofuel processing into hydrogen um, through this kind of unique process called microbial electrolysis, which uses biology and electrochemistry um, to make hydrogen. Um, but we decided to roll that into a company and focus on food waste as well as renewable power to kind of take the energy from that's uh, lost in waste and the energy from renewable electricity and produce hydrogen, which can be used as an energy storage mechanism and in new applications as a zero emission fuel. Um, and so we've continued to evolve and develop here in the Knoxville area and hope to remain here as well. That's fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Um, Don, you're up with the Ionix. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So uh, we actually, we founded uh, Ionix back in New York uh, quite some time ago in uh, 20, 2013. Uh, our initial goal was to commercialize a series of molecules for ultra capacitors that we, uh, we developed in the lab that I was pursuing my PhD in. So pretty similar to what Alex is bringing to the table in, in terms of origin story. Mm -hmm. uh, we quickly learned after uh, a few years and uh, a bit of grant funding that uh, it was really expensive to uh, to make this molecule, uh, so it was 600 times the cost of the incumbent molecule, uh, which was a non-starter. Uh, and over the course of that time, we we really learned that the takeaway was it, it takes a really long time and a lot of money to vet new materials for energy storage devices. Uh, so we we kind of took what we learned over that experience and uh, developed a high throughput, low cost screening system, uh, so that we could quickly vet new materials. Uh, without needing a lot of funds on hand uh, and get to that solution uh, a lot quicker. So we came down to Knoxville. Uh, we uh, started working with Oak Ridge National Lab through the Innovation Crossroads program and uh, were able to validate the system at the pilot level. Uh, and then we've started to scale uh, our screening system uh, actually at the UT Research Park uh, here too. So we, we transitioned from Oak Ridge, uh, stayed locally. We still work with New York State actually owe Scotty's uh, group some some results data for a project. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great. And, and we've been able to deploy this technology to, to design new uh, uh, material sets for, for different energy storage applications. So non-flammable lithium ion batteries we've been working on. We have contracts with the Army uh, and also energy dense anode free batteries for electric vehicles and uh, consumer electronics. That's great. And Don, um, wh where in New York were you? Um, before you, you came down with Innovation Crossroads? So we were in Albany, New York. Uh, Albany, New York. And I, yeah, I originally grew up uh, around the uh, the boroughs. So uh, when when I kind of compare Albany to Knoxville, it's basically just they're the same type of city. It's just one has a winter and one doesn't. So it's, it's pretty nice <laughs> down here. Good, good. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Okay, well, thank you for that. And uh, Scotty, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on here as well. Um, Scotty Johnson, I'm the president of Excess Power Batteries and IOXIS, as Don mentioned. Uh, we manufacture lead acid and lithium batteries, as well as ultra capacitors and capacitor modules um, and all of the related accessories for commercial, industrial, and automo automotive uh, markets. Um, also founded here in Knoxville um, about a year ago, we had the opportunity to make the acquisition of the New York um, business IOXIS, which is uh, just down the road from where Don is from. And uh, we have uh, had the opportunity and the pleasure to work with Don's crew on uh, some new technology. And um, there's a, a lot of promise for, uh, for that and a lot of the other things that we have uh, that we're working on today. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I can, I can jump in um, and, and say that, you know, I think, you know, energy storage is, is relying upon the need to store energy. And so getting renewable sources of power more prevalent and expanded, you know, is, is you know, I wouldn't say a challenge, but is a necessary predecessor to, to kind of expanding this. So getting, you know, additional, you know, getting the cost 
continuing to come down for, you know, all the related things, you know, cost of solar and wind are certainly coming down rapidly, but all the related things, related energy storage, batteries, and in our case, hydrogen, um, getting those additional costs down to really help better store that renewable electricity, which in turn can continue to allow more rapid adoption of more renewable source of electricity. So it can all kind of feedback on itself to really expand rapidly if we continue to drive down the cost with the work that companies like Don and Scotty's are doing to drive down the cost of batteries and, and make it more the testing more rapid. So yeah, continuing to get the additional costs down, I think is what our companies are still all working towards um, that can really help expand that energy storage sector. Anybody want to add to that? Are there challenges that kind of jump out at the top of mind? I agree with what Alex is, is saying. There's um, the adoption is, is probably going to be the hard part of completely electrifying every part of our lives. I mean, some things today require uh, so much reliance on combustion power. Uh, changing over to fully electric everything is, is going to take a while. I know a lot of car manufacturers are um, setting a deadline in 2030, 2035 timeline for fully electric that to, to me seems short. <laughs> uh, it feels like there's a lot of work uh, to do, not only from the car manufacturer side, but from us as humans that rely on um, coal power and other forms of energy to, to get to that level. The infrastructure needs a lot of work. You know, if suddenly you flip the switch and everyone had electric vehicles. Um, I'm not sure we would have enough uh, infrastructure to support that. Um, so there's a lot of work. Uh, I think Knoxville can contribute to that with, you know, some companies like all of ours um, that are kind of looking forward to reduce the cost and, and make that transition a little easier. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Scotty and Alex. I, I think when it comes to like energy storage market and, and developing new products for the space, uh, it's a very capital intensive endeavor. Uh, so it takes a lot of money. Um, everybody's kind of racing to a low cost product. So it's difficult to make margin on those products and, and also compete in the landscape. Uh, but with that said, at least the the worst the worst challenge or the most difficult challenge, uh, I, I think, is, has kind of been resolved, which is uh, there's an energy storage market materializing on the horizon. So as Scotty said, every car manufacturer is, is looking to, to electrify. And I think utilities are recognizing uh, with renewables coming online, they're going to have to have some kind of intermittent storage solution. So we're we're at a point where investing in this technology and uh, devoting resources towards this capital intensive endeavor actually makes sense. So it's, it's a little bit easier of a case to make. We don't have to say, hey, this is coming on the horizon. I think everybody sees that it's it's imminent. So it's an easier sell on our part. So I think... Um Sorry, guys, I'll go first here. Uh, these guys have a lot more insight uh, working directly with the lab than I do. Um, I know that as a whole worldwide, um, things are exploding. You know, we're, uh, opportunities are everywhere and the growth is, is pretty immense. But in our in our region, I know that uh, TVA has uh, kind of played a part historically. Um, I'm familiar with uh, one point in the past where TVA partnered with an ultra capacitor company similar to ours uh, in testing new technology. Uh, they uh, completed a trial with um, a one megawatt storage system that was called the FAX system. Um, you guys might be familiar with that. Uh, we're also, um, as far as our company, we're actively engaging with uh, people in the nuclear power industries um, and they're considering using some of the products that we manufacture, whether it be lithium battery or ultra capacitor type uh, products to um, use as uh, storage or backup for uh, a quick delivery of energy uh, that they generate. Um, so to me, it seems like there are a lot of opportunities like that. And you know, now I'll divert to these other guys who are really ingrained in it and let them speak to it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very exciting for, for this region. Uh, I think Knoxville has all the ingredients to, to make a really successful energy storage ecosystem, uh, especially considering we have we have companies like, like Scotty's where you're already uh, selling selling products. Uh, you're you're farther down the value chain than some of us where we're obviously in materials R&D, but 
we kind of have a, a great ecosystem of materials R&D, great talent from Oak Ridge National Lab locally. We have somebody like Scotty who's, who's compiling this technology and actually pushing out the door. And then we have adopters too in the form of TVA and EPRI that's locally as well. So I think we, we have a full stack of uh, an energy storage ecosystem in this region. It's just we really need to, to push it forward and drive those connections so that we can uh, help it grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll echo the same thing. Having having entities like TVA and EPRI locally that are really looking to- forward toward the future of, that's uh, heavily reliant on renewables and st- starting to work that direction. Um, and they 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 already are making use of the of the resources that are currently here in pumped hydro as this form of energy storage, where TVA is already getting into that or has been doing that for some time. But now starting in with the the Von Orr battery energy storage system to to look at that new the new area of battery storage as well. Um, so they're really, you know, looking to to take that those steps, you know, in advance, and that allows, you know, companies like like Don and Sky to really start to contribute and expand the reach in in the area. And so, that, and then like they said with ORNL and UT and all the other universities in the area, there's a real an opportunity to continue to drive some of the advanced uh, technology adoption that needs to happen to get prepared um, for the energy storage that's going to be needed going forward. And that's great. I mean, in our economic development outreach efforts, I mean, we're always talking about Oak Ridge National Lab. We're always talking about the University of Tennessee. We're talking much more about EPRI uh, in this sector uh, and, and TVA. So it's um, it's that we're just so fortunate to have all of those entities right here. And it's just kind of this perfect collision of technology and minds and research and, and, and innovation coming from it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think there's three things. I mean, uh, we, we first, we, we have a good, we have a good starting point. Uh, so everybody on this call, uh, Alex, Scotty and myself, uh, we, we have aligned interests, uh, and calls like these networking events like these, uh, hopefully in the future, we can do something similar in, in person and really tie in, uh, EPRI TVA a little bit more. We've had the, the ability to do that prior, uh, with, uh, innovation crossroads. Uh, so that, that would be fantastic. Then second, importing other companies. I, I don't want to say I want to invite competition, but it, it helps from a workforce standpoint. If we have more companies that uh, are in the same industry, uh, so that's going to help from an recruitment standpoint. Uh, instead of saying, hey, come to our company, move to this new city, and then if it doesn't work out, <laughs> you got to leave and go someplace else. If we have uh, a more competitive ecosystem with uh, with a few other uh, companies that that have similar needs in terms of labor, uh, then yeah, it will be annoying recruiting with each other. But it, I, at the end of the day, we'll be able to import more talent to the region. So I think everybody will benefit. And uh, then third, uh, facilities for us. So this is this is a little bit uh, specific, but uh, we we just need uh, uh, kind of high tech uh, manufacturing space uh, that we're looking. Uh, for, for something in the area that, that would suffice. So that's that's been on our wish list for a while. Uh, the University of Tennessee Cherokee Farms Research Park has done a great job giving us a starting point for a lab, uh, but we're, we're already starting to, to outgrow that facility. So, which is good, it's a good problem to have, but uh, we, we need to find places to transition into. Sure, sure, that, three great things. I mean, more collaboration, that's always a good thing. Uh, find other companies that can play in this space, and then you know the the bricks and mortar kind of real estate things. On um, uh, on the real estate, is it is it kind of standard industrial buildings, or do you guys do we need more lab space? You know, what's what's that look like uh, from a from that facility space angle? We're still uh, specking out in industrial space, figuring out needs there, but definitely from a lab space perspective. <laughs> Uh, I can yeah. say, and I, I don't know how Alex is, is doing on lab space, but I'm sure he's, he's planning on growing pretty soon too. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit difficult to find uh, development space that, that meets the safety and, and EHS mm-hmm. needs that, uh, that, that we unfortunately have. Yeah, I'll echo what Don said, that, that, they're, that the ORNL and the City of Knoxville provide great resources to get started in UT, where we have, yeah, we're just working at ORNL and Recent Crossroads, the UT Cherokee Farm, and, and I'm a current tenant at Fairview Technology Center um, which Knoxville houses. So all these things are great to incubate and get small com- or companies going, and which has been great to foster things, but to go to the next level, like Don said, I think um, there probably are still some limitations. And we are, yeah, getting to the point where we're looking to see what is out there as we potentially would look to um, transition out of here in the next year or so to see where we can go. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that's very exciting that we're transitioning out of that space because that mm -hmm. creates a vacancy for somebody else to come in. So another mm -hmm. company at, at our current stage, Alex's current stage, mm -hmm. can we can start importing startups or early stage energy storage companies from other parts of the country because I can say that everywhere we go, lab space where you have a certain level of autonomy at the price, price point, especially when you're a smaller company in, in hard tech, it's it's very difficult to come across anywhere in the country. So that's that's definitely something this area can leverage and, and market to, uh, to to other companies looking for a home. Sure thing. Well, I'll, I'll take this moment, it, a, a brief commercial on Chamber Economic Development Services. Scotty's Scotty's well well aware of this, but as you guys look to grow into additional space, um, let us know. I mean, we we track available uh, buildings, offices, industrial spaces, land. Uh, throughout Knox County, and, and we can lean on our partners throughout the region. So if, if you're looking to go from an 800 square foot, you know, suite at Fairview Technology Center to a 5,000 square foot facility to a 300,000 square foot facility, we can help. We can help identify, we can help streamline that process. I think for, for me, particularly, one of our uh, tough parts right now is finding um, skilled labor production work um you know it, it might not be the uh, ultimate goal for a lot of companies in my position to find a local workforce to actually build and make things i think the, the consensus is there are people overseas who can do it a lot more efficiently than we can um, but there's a, a lot of what we do that's very proprietary and some of that I would like to keep here as much as possible, which is the reason we've had conversations lately about expanding our operations so we can have a larger uh, lab area um, and bring in more talent from anywhere from uh, chemical engineers, application engineers, um, you know, all the way down to the production level. Uh, and I think a lot of that starts with the college and, and uh, tech schools, you know, I'm, I'm not, I haven't gone as far as to really investigate the programs that they offer that are specifically related to our industry. But um, if there are programs that focus on that, that um, collecting some of that, uh, those human assets out of that when it's um, when they come out would be very valuable to us. And if those programs do not already exist, having something planned on the horizon for not only companies like mine, but any others that um, the economic development uh, group is trying to bring into town to create that that hub of power related people um, that would be very helpful for, for anybody looking to come to this area. Yeah. Alex, any any other kind of key workforce needs that, that you have for your business? Yeah, I think I, I would, you know, echo very similar things there. And then uh, and then additionally, with our company being a little bit unique in the group in terms of having some biology involved, you know, at least for and that's where I guess our needs transitioning from where we are now to where we will be. You know, a lot of it is R&D and scale up right now. So we do have a need, a lot of technical need for chemical engineers, you know, molecular biology, the biologists. And we are tapping into the local ecosystem of, of uh, universities to meet those needs. Um, uh, but continue to attract those same type of people from out of state to, to come move here is, is something we definitely would like to see. Um, and then looking down the line to when all of our companies are more commercialized and our products are out there and we're looking to, to expand the sales and maintain them, whether there's some new kind of, uh, you know, trade programs, if you will, to that focus on energy storage and power where it may not be an advanced degree, but something really focused on what's needed to, to advance the energy storage and renewable power area um, that they could do some kind of trade or two-year program focused specifically on that could be something down the line that's needed to really um, take this further. Very good. And, and you know, as as you guys are having workforce needs, um, again, the, the, the chamber and our, our teams can help kind of expedite your onto the on-ramp with the community colleges, with UT. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got some great collateral that kind of shows what the, the Pellissippi State and Rome State and the TCATs, what what degrees and, and training services they provide, as well as even in Knox County, the different CTE programs that are at the high school level. So it kind of potentially build relationships with kind of on, on the earlier phases of that on pipeline. Yeah, I mean, I, I wake up every day to a new article, something uh, 
new uh, that's on the horizon. <laughs> There's no no shortage of um, chemical makeups that are that are out there. Um, you know, I've seen some uh, companies releasing for trial purposes sodium-based lithium batteries, um, and uh, solid state has been a lot of uh, focus and talk about that coming. Um, so, so yeah, I think there will be, um, you know, in the years to come, a multitude of different new um, ways to manufacture a lithium battery. I think the majority of those are going to be focused on how to do it um, more sustainably and less expensive. I think that's one of the main keys to, um, you know, to the long-term outlook of lithium-based batteries. Um, you know, there are plenty of applications that ultra capacitors can step in uh, where lithium batteries are currently being used, which is uh, inherently a more sustainable direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, there there's always going to be something new coming along, but I think something that's important to, to keep in mind, um, and I remind myself of this every day, is change doesn't typically happen instantaneously. It's not as if we wake up tomorrow and there's some new technology that's all of a sudden taking over and everything else dies off. Uh, I mean, we still make lead acid batteries and it's a pretty serious staple of our business and uh, they're great for a lot of things. Their recycling programs are uh, phenomenal. I mean, they're 99% uh, lead is like one of the most, re is the most recycled uh, commodity out there. So, um, you know, I think, there will be a future where lead is uh, going down in terms of how you know much it's being used for certain things like starting uh, combustion engines. If the trend continues the way everybody would like to see it, um, combustion engines won't exist anymore. <laughs> Not as much, at least. So uh, lead batteries won't be used for that. But you know we're already offering ultra capacitor and lithium based products for engine starting and and sometimes those items are better suited anyway so so yeah there are plenty of new things on the horizon um i don't have a list to, uh, prepared to read off of what i think are the top contenders but <laughs> plenty of stuff out there exciting stuff there you go when anybody else want to add to that don alex yeah, I can add in just to the other other um, area that's a little less developed here in Tennessee and, and mostly in the U.S. as well is, is you know, outside the battery, looking at, at kind of the general power to gas kind of area that we would be in um, where gases like mol or like hydrogen, which can be made from, you know, storing electricity and splitting water. But in our, in our case, using food waste combined with electricity to make hydrogen, which can be stored for longer periods of time and then run back through a fuel cell to generate electricity or use as a fuel fuel cell. Um, vehicles, which as Sky just mentioned, you know, with which they met, the move away from combustion um, to electrify batteries and fuel cells are going to be the main main way that I think, you know, and all of the above kind of strategy is going to be needed to really go forward. So the gas can fill a, an additional role in certain areas by being stored for, for longer periods. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with both the comments before. I, I, I think a diverse array of solutions are going to be necessary. Um, with respect to lithium ion battery chemistries, uh, I, I, I think current the current architecture uh, of traditional uh, liquid electrolyte uh, cathode anode lithium ion batteries, their economies of scale and their current cost profile, it's just difficult to compete with. So I would be very surprised if anything came along that that would be able to mm -hmm. to to compete in that space in the next decade or even two decades, even with solid state on the horizon. So I, I'd be weary of any chemistry that you know, that's kind of uh, propped up just because it's, it's pretty easy to make a couple prototypes that, that do a great job, but it's very difficult to hit the price point that lithium ion batteries have, have reached at this point. Us, yeah, as you mentioned, going to school here and starting the company here that we already kind of had a, a presence and then getting into the nation crossroads allowed us to continue being here. And so I think you know, since my time as a student to starting the company and then being in the company for multiple years, we've certainly seen the growth of the of the entrepreneurial ecosystem around Knoxville, with the KEC interacting with folks like yourself at the chamber and just the in, and RNL UT. There's just a really good environment growing to kind of foster and allow people to interact and really learn from each other to to really keep companies coming here, just from that standpoint, but also just the 
um, you know, the resources that are available, the, you know, the cost of living, the tax situation are all are very positive things for, for being here. Um, and I'll just kind of somewhat digress from the, the main thing to say that I, you know, I really enjoy living in Knoxville, not being a native of, of the Southeast or anything. I think, you know, living in this area is certainly, a, you know, something I've enjoyed and, and see myself staying here long term as well. I'm um, just enjoying, you know, the city of Knoxville in and in and of itself. Um, but I think there's a lot of a lot of benefits to being here as a company. And we certainly plan to, to stay here in, in many capacities. We certainly will probably be having to set up same with other companies, other offices in different locations to be closer to certain customer segments or things going on. But we always want to have a hub here uh, based around R&D and, and potentially other things for customers in the area. Uh, so we really would like to stay in the Knoxville area. And there's certainly seems to be a lot of a lot of good things here that can keep us here um, that we have, you know, uh, uh, with, with the things that are growing and some of the needs we think need to come here. Um, I think they are trending that direction that can allow companies to continue to grow and expand um, in the area. Alex, I look forward to helping you find a 50,000 square foot office for your corporate headquarters. <laughs> Sounds good. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Don, perspective, um, Albany down to, to Knoxville. Um, yeah. But- <laughs> I, I, I'll be absolutely candid. I never expected that we would stay in the region at the conclusion of our engagement with Oak Ridge National Lab, coming down here, having never really spent any time in the Southeast uh, part of the United States. Uh, but with that said, I mean, since day one, uh, the community was very welcoming. Uh, the, the networking was meaningful. So it wasn't just a, a handshake uh, when you first meet and then, you know, kind of a sputtered relationship. Everybody was uh, very active in terms of uh, getting things done, uh, especially TVA. Uh, when we engage with them, they, they always tried to do as much as possible. I mean, Alex has an even more <laughs> experience with TVA in, in that respect, but they're really trying to, to grow the region. Um, uh, right after I got off the, the last networking event that the chamber uh, put together, uh, Scotty emailed me like five hours later. So it's just, it's, it's a remarkable uh, environment and community that, that that's down here. And that really, that that's the first thing that retained us. And then second, I, I do love the region. I, I think it's, uh, it's been a great cost of living, uh, great people in general. Uh, you have the Smokies that are relatively close. So uh, all of these things are, are gonna be uh, phenomenal recruitment tools for us. So we definitely envision having uh, something here <laughs> in terms of whether it be R&D or manufacturing. We still do a lot of business with upstate New York uh, between the whole region, but uh, Knoxville has definitely made its case for, for being a, a future energy storage hub. Uh, so it's just how are we going to grow in the region and, and what that's going to look like in the next five years. It'll, it'll be interesting, but I think we'll be here. That's fantastic. We love to hear that. And uh, you kind of sound like you work for the chamber, the, the way you're uh, <laughs> counting all the positives of this region. So thank you. Um, it, it, you know, it, I'm just trying it, to create those sound bites. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you guys are ambassadors of this region. You know, you, you've got lots of networks around the country or around the world, and uh, you can help help raise the profile of this place we call Knoxville and, and kind of what's going on here, whether it's within energy storage or, or another sector. Um, you know, we are we are certainly focused on, on growing this region economically, um, and you guys are, are a big part of that. Thanks. Uh, so uh, over the past actually month and a half, we've received an additional two million in grants uh, for a few different projects. So uh, we, we got to follow on phase two with the, the army. So we'll be uh, scaling up our non-flammable lithium ion battery technology and putting it in uh, systems to, to demonstrate uh, their, uh, their safety and performance in relevant army systems, which we're hoping will be enough to transition to an actual acquisition. Uh, and then we've also received uh, funding from the National Science Foundation to do more screening work uh, towards uh, that anode-free technology I, I mentioned at the top of the call, which would be aimed at electric vehicles and consumer electronics. So uh, we're gonna be doing a bit of R&D and then also uh, trying to, to scale uh, one of our, our uh, products that are coming out of the lab uh, for this military application as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Scotty, what's next for you? Well, <clears throat> Doug, as we've discussed, our, our focus today is to find uh, an area in the region where we can expand 
uh, and grow we're, we're kind of limited in the space we have here in Knoxville um, there's no shortage of opportunity uh, ahead of us <clears throat> the company uh, uh, has many different markets uh, when we're able to take on those opportunities because of space or workforce limitations we're a lot of times passing on opportunities to other areas and if we can avoid that by capturing that those opportunities uh, locally that that would be my preference so um, our focus is um, to uh, remain uh, concentrated on our battery production our ultra capacitor based uh, energy storage um, uh, opportunities and continue to grow from there okay great thank you yeah, and so for Electroactive, we are uh, transitioning out of the Innovation Crossroads program as a part of cohort, cohort three. So it's been really great to, uh, you know, working with Innovation Crossroads and, and TVA and support, their support that we've had through the program. And we'll continue to interact with them to help advance our technology going forward. Um, but we recently also had some good news in the last few weeks where we were also awarded a, a $1 million grant to the Department of Energy um, to work with another utility, a southern company in the southeast area. Um, to help continue our scale up process and work towards uh, pilot demonstrations out in the field um, to process, you know, a half a ton of food waste per day to make a few kilograms of hydrogen per day with one of our modules um, that will serve as the basis for our commercial systems going forward, where we would stack together more modules of our system. And we'll be looking to kind of demonstrate the, you know, sustainable and reliable performance of the, of the metrics we need. And also de to demonstrate that one of the main advantages of our approach using food waste and electricity is to show that we can actually be a, a life cycle negative carbon pathway um, and kind of validating, you know, the degree that that, that is true and how much carbon we can remove per you know kilogram of hydrogen we produce. Um, so we're working towards, you know, moving from our prototypes that have been demonstrated up to that pilot project of constructing that. Um, and we're also now actively raising $1.2 million for a kind of a seed round phase two to kind of supplement that grant dollars to get more pilot projects out there and done um, to show this out in the field. That's great. I'd love to hear all the, the, the grants that have been awarded and the forward movement and uh, expansion opportunities. It's, it's really exciting. Um, guys, any questions for me? I've been asking uh, a lot of questions. Anything <laughs> you want to ask me, I'll do my best to try and answer. <laughs> yeah, no, no real, no uh, questions come to mind, but I'm just excited to, to interact with the chamber more. And we've had, I had one conversation, you know, a few months ago and, and you mentioned that at the outset, some of the vision you guys have going forward for things. And it's, you know, it's exciting to see the, the, uh, the approach and, an active approach you guys are taking in the region. So certainly looking forward to, to further interactions with you guys to contribute uh, to the region. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, same here for me. I, I can't think of any questions, but these opportunities, hopefully they continue to come up. Uh, something good comes out of it every time. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, not to sound redundant, uh, <laughs> definitely expect an email from me as well. So <laughs> yeah, definitely want to start engaging with you guys more. Yeah, bring it on. We welcome that. And uh, Scotty, Don, Alex, thank you so much again for, for taking some time out of your busy days. Um, wish you all the best of luck. And we look forward to partnering with, with all of you.